All right, everybody. First topic tonight is going to be Disney Gallery, Star Wars, The Mandalorian. So there's been two episodes to it so far. Um, one actually uh, focusing more on the directors, obviously titled Directing. And then the second one focusing on sort of the legacy of Star Wars, obviously titled Legacy. Um, now, these are sort of behind the scenes featurettes um, where they're spotlighting the various directors and creators. And they're, they haven't gotten too much into the nitty gritty of how they're actually creating the episodes. I think we're going to see more of that moving forward. Um, but you do see them filming a lot of stuff, which is kind of interesting um, with that room, this weird room with the giant screen. So they can actually do a lot of, uh, uh, isn't that called, I'm trying to remember, Eric, is it, is it called back projection where they have the thing going behind them? They haven't talked about that a lot yet. You know, so I'm not exactly sure what the term is. In fact, uh, yeah. I guess I should just mention it right off the bat. I'm a little disappointed they haven't been talking about that because yeah. <laughs> I'm very interested in that technology. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I don't even know what the term is because they really haven't talked about that. Like you said, they haven't really got into the technical aspects. The first episode is directing and the second e episode is legacy. Um, so, yeah, they haven't got into a lot of a lot of the, the meat yet, at least the stuff that I'm really interested in. I will mention that, um, that there are three more episodes that have titles, like I'm looking at the IMDb right now, and the next episode is going to be cast, so they're going to be obviously talking to the actors more. The next one after that is technology, so hopefully we'll get some more of, of what you're talking about there, Dave, and the technology, and then there's a one on practical, so I assume that's going to be about practical effects. So that's the stuff that I'm really looking forward to. And um, I guess that's kind of a good segue into my sort of initial impressions of these first two episodes is that, uh, you know, I, I liked them, but I felt they were a little light. What, what, did, what about you, Dave? How do you feel about, you know, just general impressions of these first two episodes? I, I, I enjoyed them. I, I honestly really enjoyed them. I felt like I, I, I think I liked the second episode better than the first one. Just because I enjoyed hearing uh, Dave uh, Filoni talking about um, like the time that he spent with George Lucas and talking about specifically Star Wars as George Lucas created it and how everything's uh, when you look at Lucas's films, when you talk about the original films, the prequels and how they um, connect and kind of sync up um, and, you know, talking about how a lot of this is influencing the work that they're doing on The Mandalorian. Because I do feel like that The Mandalorian definitely fits within um, Lucas's Star Wars, in my mind. That's just me. It's just my personal opinion. I, I really do feel like The Mandalorian feels like he lives um, in that same Star Wars world that I grew up um, loving and watching. Um, and uh, even though um, it's not... I mean, it's it's kind of Boba Fett light, you know, the show is. Um, but I love it. I, I really, really love The Mandalorian. Um, it's, um, I think, so, yeah, for me, I think it was the second episode I enjoyed the most. There was some interesting stories in the first one, though. I did enjoy listening to uh, Bryce Dallas Howard talk in the first episode. And she talked specifically about the how, what she was trying to bring to it. Because from the technical side and whatever, she was kind of newer to some of this um, and talked about how she approached it specifically from the standpoint of performance. And I thought that was really interesting. And in that crazy, crazy story, she talks about being dragged around by her father, who is Ron Howard, um, who did Backdraft. Um, Backdraft is the main film I think of him for, um, but he's directed so many movies, it's not even funny. Of course, he also did Willow? Solo. You don't think about Willow? No, I don't think about Willow. Wow. But I love Backdraft. I love Willow. <laughs> so um, it's interesting her talking about how her father got to a certain point where he would drag her around with things, and she uh, fell asleep in his lap, and that he was having a dinner, uh, uh, that Ron Howard was having a dinner that night with actually George Lucas and Kurosawa, Akira Kurosawa. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. So even though she may not be – Tech, on the technical side, maybe up on a lot of this stuff as much as everyone else. I did find it very interesting that when you think about it, she's probably grown up around this stuff in a in a context a lot of us may not be familiar. 
Oh, of so. course. Yeah, her childhood must have been really interesting. And she did. That was an interesting story that you're talking yeah. about there. Yeah. Uh, Orville Nation is in the house, by the way. He's saying Hi, hot, hello. And ooh, Mandalorian talk. Yes, we're yeah. talking about Disney, uh, Disney Gallery, uh, The Mandalorian, the first two episodes, directing and legacy. And uh, focusing on the first episode, uh, Dave, of directing, um, I do agree with you. I think Legacy is the stronger of the two episodes, interestingly enough, even though technically speaking, the directing episode would be more, I guess, like a traditional behind the scenes because they're talking to the directors about their style and a little about their history, all that kind of stuff. And that gets more into kind of what, I guess, traditional BTS behind the scenes is, at least in my mind. Uh, it usually wouldn't necessarily focus on legacy and story but I, I agree with you i think legacy is the better of the two episodes in fact i do kind of feel that in the directing episode there was a little bit too much patting each other on the back if that makes sense yeah. to you um and that it, that was a little off-putting to me um but uh you know i don't want to get too um i don't want to be too negative about it i thought it was a, it was an interesting episode it just wasn't the kind of BTS stuff that I enjoy. Like we were talking earlier, I like the technical aspects, things like that. But I did see, I did think Legacy was a much stronger um, episode, uh, specifically because of uh, Filoni. Uh, wh wh when he was talking about, you talked about it. When he was talking about the the story arc of the first, uh, you know, uh, six movies, the the original trilogy and the and the prequels, which I found it very interesting. He did not include Disney Wars in that discussion. It was all about George Lucas's legacy. And I really like that. Even just talking about right now, it makes me feel really good to see somebody defending George Lucas like that. And the way he he um the way he encapsulated the entire arc of the first, you know, six movies, none of the Disney Wars stuff, none of the Disney Wars stuff. He was talking specifically about the original trilogy and the prequels and Anakin's, because you know, I've I've said I've always thought that myself. You know, at first you think, you know, Star Wars is about Luke Skywalker, right? That's because he's like the hero. But with the prequels, you realize the first six movies are about Darth Vader. They're about Anakin, right? It, it changes your entire perspective of those first six movies. Um, and Darth Vader's always been my favorite. I've, al I've always been a Vader guy. You know, I, I, I love Vader. I love Darth Vader. So him talking that way, I thought was really interesting, especially because in the second episode, they do feature Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, not a, a whole lot, but she's there. And there's some interesting body language going on too between her and uh, and Favreau. Uh, did you yeah. notice that? Where he's kind yeah. of dismissive of her? Like, yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? So let's talk about some cool stuff. You know what? I noticed that. Uh, I thought it was very interesting because, you know, there's a lot of rumors behind the scenes that the, those two are really going at it right now for control of Lucasfilm and Star Wars. I don't know if you've heard those rumors. Uh, but there's a lot of rumors out there that the two of them do not get along. And that body language, like he was, he wasn't, she was like sitting right next to him and he like, doesn't even look at her. I, I, I did you notice that? I mean, I, I that I noticed I, I, that. I did. Yeah. I, I noticed that. And I noticed that uh, Filoni didn't talk anything about Disney Wars. He would, he is a George Lo Lucas loyalist. That's, that's, that's what I took from that. Did you have a, a take on that? I, I mean, I felt the same way. But I think, too, it's kind of unique because Filoni spent a lot of time working with Lucas when they were creating the Clone Wars. And, you know, the Clone Wars is, is again, this is just my opinion, the Clone Wars is one of the better of some of the newer Star Wars stuff they've done as well. And I would even go so far as to say that, holy cow, this last season episodes with Ahsoka and Maul, man, that stuff's powerful. That's interesting. Um because I've seen uh, the uh, the last season, I've, I've I'm now officially caught up with the last season, um, and even though we're not talking about it on the show here, let me just tell you that that if if you love Star Wars, I think the Clone Wars is something you should definitely take a look at if you're looking at. Uh, sorry about that. I was coughing. I didn't want anyone else to have to listen to that. <laughs> But no, the, the, the Clone Wars, those last few episodes are absolutely fantastic. So you recommend them? Because I actually haven't seen them. So you, you do recommend that you're talking about the current season on uh, Disney Plus, right, Dave? 
Yes, yes. The new season is really, really good. And it's really kind of cool, too, because they actually had Darth Maul, uh, uh, Ray Park, who played Darth Maul in Phantom Menace. Ray actually came back, um, and I've met Ray on several occasions over the years. I'm a huge Ray Park fan. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but in the studio, I actually have autographed photos that actually hang in the studio, and, and Ray Park is right over there next to Jeremy Bullock as Boba Fett. Um, so I'm a oh, huge, awesome. <laughs> huge Maul fan. I'm a huge Boba Fett fan. So all this stuff, I'm a huge Ahsoka fan. I love Ahsoka. I think she's really cool. Um, I, I just, you know, it's one of those things that I, I first started watching The Clone Wars, I wasn't too sure about her character, but over time she really won me over. Um, in the in the fanzine, actually, um, I actually put these in specifically because of how much I enjoyed The Clone Wars. There's actually some uh, fan art here. I did of um, a Mandalorian, a female Mandalorian commando uh, right here that's in uh, the magazine. This has never actually been printed before. So that, uh, for those of you who collect my art, this will be the first time you can actually get this image actually printed. There's a female Mandalorian commando. And then right there, there's Ahsoka on the title page. So um, yeah, I, I loved, loved those episodes. Man, that last one is powerful. If you've been into Clone Wars, that last episode, there's, a, there's this scene with Vader Holy cow. It's just amazing. So um, Filoni, in my yeah, opinion, well, he, he he really gets it. And listening to him talk and having... And I had just finished watching the Clone Wars stuff and then hearing him talk, I was like going, this is the guy. Now I get it. Because I, I, I loved a lot of Filoni's work, but I didn't really, I think, get it, get it. Because there's a lot of Star Wars fans like Filoni should be kind of like the showrunner uh, for Star Wars or, or the person who's kind of keeping up with um, what they're doing in terms of connecting the world and helping shape the stories, like what Kevin Feige um, is doing um, with Marvel. And a lot of people say Dave Filoni should be that guy for Star Wars. And I love what Favreau and Filoni are doing with Mandalorian. And here, the more I hear them talk, and especially in Legacy, Filoni, man, he, he won me over big time. I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm down. That, so. That's definitely the, the high point of the series so far. Just him summing up the original yeah. trilogy and, and, the, and the prequel trilogy, tying it all together. And it was kind of funny because he's at the director's round table and they're just all listening to him. You know, they just list, they let him just go yeah. off and, I and totally too. <laughs> break down the story. And it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, he, he before this, he was, you know, a, an animation director. You know, and yeah. sometimes live action directors kind of look down on animation directors. You know what I mean? That there's de there's definitely that definitely happens. There's no doubt about it. Um, and so, you know, they just sit there kind of in awe of him summing up the story. And again, I just felt like this is a real Lucas, you know, George Lucas loyalist here. You know what I mean? That he's really advocating for Lucas's vision, not Disney Wars. I just thought that was just so pronounced and it gave me a lot of hope. Uh, for the Mandalorian going forward. Obviously, there's lots of rumors that uh, a lot of characters from the Clone Wars are going to be featured um, in um, in the Clone Wars. In fact, that's one of my pop culture articles, a, a recent announcement, a, a recent casting announcement. Um, so obviously, I'll, he's bringing a lot of those characters to the table. At least that's what we're hearing. Um, so it, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. It was also interesting. I think it was actually the directing episode. Uh, he talked about how he got the job in the first place. Because he was a, a into 2D animation and working at Nickelodeon, and he didn't think he would be a good fit for the Clone Wars being 3D right. at, at all. Because he was actually, I think, as I understood it, he was kind of like thinking more along the lines of the first Clone Wars cartoon, which was t right. 2D. And he was like, oh, yeah, I could do that. And then they're like, but we're not going to do that anymore. Which, by the way, I think that's a very underrated series in, in and of itself. It's a different take on the Clone Wars, but it establishes, in fact, that's like the first time we see General Grievous is in, in that version of, of Clone Wars. And what's kind of nice about that is you can you can watch that pretty much in just one sitting easy. I think it's only like an hour and a half of content when it's all put together because they were minisodes. But it's kind of funny to see him talk about that because he did come from a, a 2D animation world with Nickelodeon television an, animation. And Lucas is like, yeah, we're not going to be doing that. You know, <laughs> that's not what we're doing. We're going to be doing 3D. He's all like, well, what do you want me for kind of thing? But uh, he got the job. Uh, Lucas liked him when he met him and and he ended up getting the job so that's another interesting story and i believe that is in the first episode in directing when he talks about that yeah yeah and and uh and i can i can also uh actually recommend and endorse 
uh, Gendy Turkowski's Clone Wars as well. And that was the original 2D animated cartoons. All, all that stuff's great. You know, it's one of those things. I don't think initially the Clone Wars really kind of met up with some of our imaginations of what we thought it would be when, when they first mentioned the Clone Wars. Um, but I've really grown to really, over time, um, really love a lot of this stuff that they've done that takes place in that era. And I begin to realize how much um, there is to mine from that era in Star Wars. And and it's it's great, too, because since we have uh, Tarkowski's version of Clone Wars, and then we have the later 3D animated stuff that um, Filoni's been working on, um, it's interesting because they're, 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 they're similar yet different, um, right. and they're all really good. That's the thing that's really cool. So um, uh, I can't recommend all this stuff enough it, 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 but bear in mind i'm one of those people i love the star wars special sequence of boba fett the 2d animated like i'm all about that like that was fun um and i still love that to this day hey we um, we need we need the holiday special on disney plus remastered i'm a big <laughs> advocate of that we need it we need it uh we do have some I, comments from from the rogues gallery uh and uh james stone was just said he was popping in quick to say hi to you retro fellow so james want to acknowledge you and say hello back and then and thanks, uh, pj mentioned thanks. go ahead i'm sorry dude. i was just gonna say and thanks again james for your contribution to the retro uh rogues fan scene people will be seeing that very soon very soon we definitely appreciate that thank you very much and then pj who's also featured in the uh, uh the news uh, the uh fanzine uh he, he was talking about my comment earlier he said uh, true uh cbs looked down on seth when he approached them to take charge on trek now they're regretting it loud, yeah, out loud. True. and of course pj is our expert on everything orville and on uh, on seth mcfarlane and uh he, he was he's referencing my comment earlier about yes unfortunately there are live action people that look down on animation and they look down on animation directors writers actors in fact we, we talked about that before uh some of the controversy with uh, the ahsoka casting because yeah. they didn't use the, the voice actor, and I think that part of that is the voice actor bias, that they were just like, nah, we're not going to use the voice actor. We're going to get a you know Hollywood uh, you know film actor, you know Rosario Dawson's the big rumor that she's going to be playing Ahsoka instead of um, instead of the voice actor uh, who plays instead her. Instead of Ashley Eckstein, forward. which I thought, I think if, if Ashley wanted to do it, I, I honestly think she could do it. I think it'd be kind of cool. I'd like to see her do it. I don't, I don't, you know, Either way, I'm excited for what they do with Mandalorian season two, one way or the other. You know, if if I was able to avoid, you know, have a vote, you know, I would vote to see <laughs> Ashley do it, um, just because she's so closely associated with that character. She loves Star Wars so much. I mean, you know, her universe, which is and she's a fan favorite, and she's a fan yeah. favorite, like at conventions yeah. and things like that. I know that fans really like her. She she likes posing. I've seen uh, clips where fans will give her. You know, uh, they're they're you know they're they're lightsabers, so she can pose with them. And I think a lot of that was in, with the idea that hey, maybe someday she can do the live action version of Ahsoka. You know what I mean? I think that's yeah. why fans were yeah. advocating for that, taking those pictures because they're all over the internet where she's posing with these really nice lightsabers. They're not hers. Fans are giving them to her. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, you know, there's there's some definite uh, controversy there you know, as far as that casting goes and on both sides. Both sides. But I will mention this too. Ashley does have her own set of Ash, uh, uh, the Ahsoka lightsabers because Ahsoka fights with two swords. Oh, she does. Is, yeah, and she does have a set of both of those. They they uh, made a presentation of that actually at Star, the last Star Wars celebration actually, and they brought them out on stage and presented them to her, and she lit them up on stage, and you could totally see her geeking out. She's that's the thing. She loves this stuff, and and if it were up to me, if I get to vote, I would like to see Ashley give it a shot because I think she could do it really well. Obviously, she's going to know Ahsoka; she's been playing that character now for some some quite some time, so closely associated with it, and it'd be amazing to to be able to make that connection because it's interesting. Well, we'll say for pop culture. I think I know one of the the rumors you're going to be talking about, and it actually dovetails into what we're talking about right now about you know, let the voice actress play that character. And that, that's just my opinion, so. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, uh, one thing that I talk about is, remember, a lot of actors, a lot of uh, directors, writers, they're not fans. They're just not, you know what I mean? So that it's kind of nice 
when you do have an actor who who really seems to be a fan and really into it, uh, Filoni obviously and Favre are are huge Star Wars fans. You can just tell that, and, and that comes through in this series that they are real and they're Lucas fans. They're not yeah. Disney War fans. You can just tell that. You know what I mean? They're they're Lucas loyalists. That's I'm going to start using that term. The Lucas loyalists. That's because that's what I'm really feeling from this, and that's probably the most hopeful thing that I'm getting out of this series so far. Is is that that idea that these two guys, they really wanted to go back to George Lucas's vision, go back to, you know, uh, bread and butter Star Wars, if you will. You know, you know, the, the kind of you think about this series, it's very much what Star Wars comes from with those old like Flash Gordon serials. It's a serialized show. Right. Uh, yeah. but, but it's also funny. What I like is I call uh, The Mandalorian like almost like a hybrid show because it's both episo episodic and serialized. In other words, they have self-contained stories with a middle beginning and the end where the story is done. And it doesn't really impact the larger story, which is of course the child and baby Yoda, which is my favorite. Right. But right. that's that's the overarching story. That's the um the serialized nature of the show. But for instance, like they talked about that heist episode uh that one of the directors was talking about that where he got to write on it as well. Like he was involved in the writing. That's just a self-contained little movie. You know what I mean? That has nothing to do with the with the overarching story. It, it might come back later this season, but that was a completely self-contained story from you know beginning, middle to end. And so I kind of like that hybrid approach, you know, that they're doing because I think that can work better than, for instance, like with Picard, where it was all um, serialized and it just felt like the story took forever to get anywhere. And then at the end of it, I'm just like, what? You know what I mean? Like, like, okay, the, right. the story's okay. over. Who cares now? Oh, you got the crew together. You know, and I'm like, okay. You know, it, it, it just was off putting to me. I, I like, I like a, a self-contained story. I, I, I like the old episodic type of shows. Although I also like those big arcs that go through the entire season. So I, I think the Mandalorian has a unique approach right now in terms of doing that. No. Yeah. And I, Again, like I said, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, I, I'm very excited to see the rest of the Disney Gallery episodes for The Mandalorian One. Very excited for what they're going to do with season two. Um, and again, like I said, for those of you that have a Disney Plus subscription, they're interested. I would highly recommend checking out the Clone Wars. Uh, a lot of that stuff in that last season is is really awesome. Um, I really, really personally myself thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so much so, like I said, there's fan art in the fanzine for me because I, I had no intention of including any of that stuff in this. And then after watching The Clone Wars, I was like, going, man, that was so good. And I want to have something to represent that. So I included it specifically for that reason. Because um, the seriously, ch check it out. Check it out. It's, it's, it's really good stuff, I think. Um, and so I guess we'll go ahead and we'll get into our recommendations. Uh, to, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now. I'm going to say the Disney Galley Mandalorian series is worthwhile. Uh, one of the things that's nice is if if an episode doesn't particularly hook you too much, uh, they're not terribly long. Um, right. <laughs> so you're, not, you're not investing yeah. a ton of time into them. But if you've enjoyed The Mandalorian, if you're curious about the craft of directing, for example, if you love Star Wars, um, I think both of these first two episodes are worth giving a view. I think, I think they're interesting, and uh, I think they're worthwhile. I think they're fun. Um, Excited for some of the ones we've got coming up because I, I want to see the a little bit more of the technical side. I want to see them maybe at least spend a little bit of time, even even if they only wax poetic and talk about it in large overarching terms. I want to hear more about this crazy room they got that they're, uh, I, I think it's called back projection. Um, uh, it, it's because it's basically like if you saw the old movies back in the days, like we're talking back in the, the 40s and the 50s, and there's the person driving the car, and in yeah. the back, in the background, um, they have basically a film playing. So it looks like they're driving or whatever, but you could tell that. Although it doesn't really look that way. It usually no, looks no. pretty cheesy. It looks really bad, actually, most of the and time. And they, yeah. did, they did back projection, uh, actually, too. And I might be using the wrong term, but they used the same technique in the original Battlestar Galactica. There's a lot of fun outtakes because they have these special effects shots that John Dykstra did with the Cylon ships flying in, and the actors are trying to time it. And they've got all these clips of like Dirk Benedict and uh, Richard Hatch. And they're like, Apollo, look. And they're trying to look over and like time it. And they can't time it quite right. And then they start laughing because they're having such a hard time doing it. Because the, the shot, the cuts are so quick. And they, they're trying, 
So it's fun and it's kind of neat that we have sort of like a modern version of that idea in the Mandalorian. I think it's really kind of fun and kind of cool. So I'm definitely interested in the technical side, but I think the Mandalorian, this series, the Disney gallery is totally, totally worth watching. How do you feel about it, Eric? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's like you said, I definitely think the second episode is better than the first one. Uh, although I wouldn't say skip the first episode. I would say still watch it, especially if you are interested in directing and directors and all that kind of stuff. One thing I, I did feel was that they didn't give enough attention to the director of photography because I know enough about television production to know that really, really it's all about the director of photography because the, the directors are, you know, they, they come and go. That's the way television works. They use multiple directors. So that director of photography, who they do have on the episode talking a little bit, he mostly just talks about how great the directors were. Well, it's like, I would like to let more talk to him and see what his perspective is because he has to work with all of them. And really, he's the one that has to maintain that consistent look. Uh, a lot of people wonder about that. It's like, how, how do you keep that consistent look in a television series when you have multiple directors? Well, it usually falls upon the director of photography, folks, the cinematographer, because a lot of times it's the same person or that he's used on multiple episodes, he or she. And they did they did have him talk, but mostly just to say how great the directors were. So that kind of stuff is, you know, that's where I said I felt it was a little light. But I would still recommend you watch it. A Legacy is worth watching simply for uh, Filoni's, um, you know, beautiful way of summing up the original trilogy and, and the prequel films. Uh, I think that just... That that's worth the price of admission right there. You know, is is just him talking about uh, you know the legacy of Star Wars and Anakin's journey. You know, he talks. He really sums it up. He he really defends Episode One. You know, he really does. He really just defends Episode One when he's talking there. And like I said, all the other directors are at the table, and they're all just listening to him. And so I, I do uh, recommend the series. I uh, mentioned I'm looking forward more to the the episodes coming up as they get more technical. The next one's going to be on casting. We'll see how that goes. But as they get into more of the technical aspects, I'm going to be, I think, really more interested in this series. So I'm, I'm definitely uh, want to keep watching it. And I do recommend it uh, to those of you that are interested in the filmmaking process, anything like that. I think it's it's a, it's a good uh, a good watch for you. And I did want to acknowledge uh, Max World Entertainment. Uh, him and uh, PJ have been going back and forth. And uh, PJ has been kind of really talking us up there. And uh, he was mentioning that... Uh, uh, should be uh, checking out our content and Max World Entertainment said would very much love to check their stuff out. So we appreciate you being here. I don't know if you're still in the chat, but we appreciate you coming out and checking us out. And my apologies if I kind of wax poetic too much and, and we didn't get those comments quite as timely. That's probably my fault because I was rambling on and on. So again, my apologies. Um, but uh, just very excited. Uh, this, epi this episode tonight, folks, there, there's one kind of major downer thing we're going to be getting to here probably in a couple minutes, unfortunately. But but hopefully we're going to look at the celebration side more than the downer side on this one item. But um, I'm, I love The Mandalorian. Um, I have just thoroughly love that show. Huge Boba Fett fan. Um, so getting to see a show like that has been just so much fun. Um, and then, of course, you know, for our retro review, we're talking about Back to the Future, one of my favorite movies of all time. So... This episode's full of win-win, folks. There, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about tonight. And I think most of our viewers have seen all of this. Those of you watching, you know, comment tonight. You know, uh, come on here and, and tell us what you think about The Mandalorian. If you've seen some of these episodes, you know, you know, we get start talking Back to the Future. Tell us what you love about Back to the Future. Let's have a conversation. The whole point here is to, to build a fun fan community where we can talk about and celebrate the things that we love. And uh, I know there's a lot of love out there for Back to the Future. So uh, I'm hoping people will come on board and, and definitely chat with us because I love this movie. There's so much great stuff to talk about so tonight. So this, this is a fun episode, everybody. I will uh, mention, though, uh, speaking of fun and all that kind of stuff and what people really like, there's really no Baby Yoda in these first two episodes. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to when they start really getting into Baby Yoda. I hope they're really going to show us Baby Yoda, the... The, uh, the animatronic, the the puppet, you know, because uh, I'm really interested in that. I, I love that kind of stuff. You know, I, I grew up on, on uh, you know, Jim Henson and the Muppets and, you know, the original Yoda and all that kind of stuff. So I really want to see baby Yoda, you know, the, the real baby Yoda, you know, I have I have a really good feeling that the reason we haven't seen too much of baby Yoda yet, 
I bet he's almost an entire episode. Uh, I, I'm I hoping. A, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm hoping. I, yeah. I think they're going to talk about, you know, the creation of the character, what inspired it. Uh, I think we're going to see the animatronics and, and how that works in, in relation to the puppetry. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think we're going to get almost a whole episode just about the child. I really do. I really believe I, I hope so. I really hope so. Because, again, I, I love that kind of stuff. Because, you know, at first I wasn't even sure whether it was a puppet. I thought it might be CGI. It's really, really good CGI. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to more information about that. And also the technology that you were talking about. Because I'm not even sure exactly what scenes they use that in. And that's how good it is. So that's that's I'm really interested in that to see which scenes that they were using that that. Uh, that uh, back screen you were talking about and, and, and see, you know, where, where it was being used and, and really how seamless it is. You know what I mean? Because you know, going back to the old school way where you're talking about driving in the car, th those scenes almost always look terrible. I mean, you can just tell they're not driving, you know, they, they almost right, always right. look awful. So, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting update to an old technology really, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then James actually has a comment here. He talks about that he's loved the series so far. And I would I would be right there with you, James. Um, I'm really enjoying uh, the Disney Galley, the Mandalorian. Um, a lot of a lot of fun. Um, to highly, highly recommend it. Um, and another good one too on Disney Plus that's fun too. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but there's one where they there's a guy who collects props and he's going around collecting props and, and they Focus in, in on certain movies that they do Mary Poppins, Pirates of the Caribbean. They do Tron. The Tron episode was a lot of fun. Um, uh, th that one's good, too. For some reason, I I'm blanking on the name, but that one's really good, too. So, so if you're I would also mention um, the Imagineering. I think it's the first two episodes. Basically, when Walt Disney's alive, I mean, that the stuff with Walt Disney and his original Imagineering crew is really good stuff. And they also talk about Walt Disney's brother, which I didn't know a lot about that story because a lot of people don't realize that uh, Walt Disney uh, founded his company with his brother and his brother was kind of the financial guy. And when Walt Disney died, he had to take over on the creative side as well. And then he died. Um, it's a really interesting story. Once uh, you know the Disney brothers are gone, uh, it really does kind of go down. Uh, the original Imagineers were amazing because they basically invented a lot of this technology. So that's another one I would recommend as well. Yes, very, very cool. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff on on Disney Plus. I know we've kind of given them a little bit of a, a razzin here and there because we feel like they should have had maybe a little bit more original content uh, on on the news side come come you know kind of hitting for the streaming. But we've seen a lot of those companies having issues. We look at CBS All Access too. Now that Picard's done, they don't really have anything going on over there either. Um, so uh, we'll have to see maybe as time moves on. The only one who's still got regular content coming out that's really good is Netflix. Netflix seems, seems to still have. Um, my wife and I just finished the second season of Dead to Me. Man, Dead to Me is a good show. Season one, season two. Can't recommend that enough. It's good stuff. Um, and then, of course, I love the third season of Ozark. I was making my way through Waco. Extraction with Chris Hems was really good. So the only one I think right now has really got it down because they got that content. Of course, Eric likes to point out they're going into debt doing it, but uh, Netflix has got that regular content churning, and it's they've got a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. So. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, Match World Entertainment said, uh, guys, sadly, I must be off. Great stream. Hope to uh, catch you uh, both again next time. Thanks, Max World, for uh, checking us out today uh, over there on YouTube. We really appreciate that. And then uh, yeah. Joss was talking about, we were, we were talking about those cheesy car scene. He's like, what the the turning to the passenger and, and talking for five minutes while not looking once at the road? <laughs> you know exactly. That's the kind of yeah, stuff they yeah. did with the very cheesy, very obvious. You know that it's a film projection behind them. You know so. Yeah, I mean, I know, the things are I not know, we're not done very well. I know it's cheesy and dated, but a lot of that stuff is very sort of quaint and, and of the era. Um, but the thing, like I said, that's kind of fun though is when you look at how much of that has been used over the years, and I just think it's. It's very interesting that they've taken that that old technique and, and given it a, a modern faceless and a, a facelift and a different approach. And they're basically reusing it because they don't just use it for the live action scenes with the actors. They use that same technique because the Ravencrest is actually 
uh, a lot of times it's an actual physical model on a motion control, and they're using it with that same giant video wall that they're filming live action actors and and people on props. And when they get into that, I think y'all are going to be surprised how much of that is practical and real effects. I was shocked because I've been reading a lot of articles about this before they even announced the show. I'm terribly, terribly interested in it because I have this crazy idea to do something with red skirts. I'm going to talk to Eric about it at some point because I, I have this crazy idea. But we'll get to that soon enough. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. That does sound like that could be a lot of fun. That could be really interesting. And again, I, I am looking forward to hopefully them talking about that more in this series, uh, that specific technology. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so we're both we're both chiming in. People should definitely check out the Disney Gallery of the Mandalorian. And uh, we're planning to stick with this, right, Dave? We're going to keep reviewing the episodes as they oh, yeah. as they come out. Is that the plan? Okay, cool. I, I I would love to. If you're down to do it, I'm totally down to do it. I really really enjoyed yeah. these. I'm really feeling like not necessarily the casting episode, but after the casting episode, I feel like this is when I, I'm really going to start getting into it, you know, where I'm, I'm really going to be like, okay, this is cool stuff, you know? So. Yeah. But see, I'm interested in the casting one too, because supposedly I think it's John Wayne's grandson. We covered this previously on an episode. John Wayne's grandson actually stands in for uh, Pedro Pascal for the Mandalorian quite a bit on the show. And I, I want to see this guy and kind of hear him talk and, I hope they'll get into the legacy of his grandfather just a little bit because that's kind of a fun thing um, when you talk about. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think they'll emphasize it very much, or do you think they're going to try to keep the myth that Pedro Pascal is doing everything? That's something I'm wondering about too. If it were me, and and that's that's how I'm look. You know, you know me. I look at it. I assume everyone's going to do or move somewhat in the way I'm moving. So I think because of the Hollywood legacy of John Wayne. And when you talk about that, you know, the original Star Wars was very much, you know, sort of like a had that Western kind of vibe, especially with Han Solo. Uh, the Mandalorian definitely has a Western vibe, whether you want to talk about the incredible musical score or how they portray. Um, you know, there's an episode called The Gunslinger, you know, I mean, yeah, but mm -hmm. let's 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 just call it out. So. I think that they'll talk to him and they'll talk about that unique Hollywood legacy and the fact that he is playing the man doing, I think they'll do it a little bit. I don't think they're going to dwell on it too much, but I would love to actually just hear him talk and just for them, because they've acknowledged it in other news articles that have been breaking on the internet. So I, I don't think it's something that's under the rug, um, but I do think it'd be kind of cool for them to talk a little bit about it. E even if they just talk about him as just sort of like a stand in and a stunt performer. I just think that's really cool that, you know, John Wayne's grandson is kind of, you know what I mean? It, it has a hand in the Mandalorian. It feels like, you know, the Duke's legacy is kind of living on a little bit. I think that's kind of fun. No, I think it's very fun. And I would love to see that. I'm just wondering whether they, they, they're going to try to perpetuate the myth that Pedro Pascal is doing everything. That's what I'm kind of curious about. So. Well, and I, I, don't, I don't think it diminishes his contributions uh, too much. And then when you look at Pedro Pascal, I mean, he's a really hot actor in Hollywood. He's going to be in the new Wonder Woman 84 movie coming out. I mean, I think he's going to be fine. Um, so I, I don't, we'll have to wait and see. You know, it's always well, funny. I, I, I'm a big, I'm a big guy in the suit person. I mean, I've met uh, Jeremy Bullock. I, I think he's awesome. He, he's a very nice person. Uh, the fans love him. Okay. He is beloved by the fans and uh, he's the guy in the suit. Uh, you know, David Prowse, the guy, he's the guy in the suit. In Star Wars, yeah. this is something that we're really into and we really appreciate and we want to know who's in the suit. You know, we, we a big thing for me with Hayden Christensen that I'll always defend him because he decided to really become yeah. Darth Vader and don the suit. And yeah. I will always respect him for that. And George Lucas didn't want to do that. Hayden Christensen fought for that. So yeah. I, I will always respect him for that because that's something big for me as a Star Wars fan. It's a huge thing for me as a Star Wars fan. But in other shows, they they definitely don't do that. You know, a lot of times the guy in the suit, you never know, even know who he is, he or she is. You know, they're just like a stunt person or whatever. You know, it's like the fall guy, the unknown stunt man. You know, it's just right, like right. so. Yeah, that's. Well, I'm just kind of curious to how they're gonna do how how they're gonna handle that. So, I I hope that I hope that they will talk about it a bit because again, too, like you said, that's one of the unique things about the legacy of Star Wars, for good or bad, sometimes. Um, is the fact that 
because there's that, uh, what is it? Uh, yes, I am your father documentary about David Prowse, which, you know, kind of looks at kind of the, the dark side of it. So, well, that's funny. He played Vader. But anyhow, I don't mean that that way. But I'm just saying there is there is that, you know, good and bad aspect of it. But um, I hope that they will acknowledge that fact, and I hope that they will talk to him a little bit. I'm, I'm hoping they will. Um, and again, I'm a huge Jeremy Bullock fan. My, I have a signed Jeremy Bullock, Boba Fett picture on the wall. Um, and I got very to nice him. man. Very nice yeah, man. Yeah, I, I got to, I got to kind of work with him when he appeared at the Phoenix Comic Con. So I got to kind of work with him directly. He helped me out with my the film festival that I was organizing. He actually came on stage to introduce a fan film that he was in. Wow. He was in this this very cheesy fan film that some fan in England made. Jerry Bullock's in it. It was a Star Wars fan film. So we actually had him come up and introduce it and everything like that. It was he's a very nice man, very cool guy. And uh or Orville Nation, PJ mentions, yes, true. Hayden rocks. Absolutely. In Christensen rocks. So I, I don't I don't like when people uh, detract on him because I, I think he is a I, I think he did a good job. It's just that's just me. Yeah. 